Uh, hi, welcome everybody, and thank you for coming out tonight in this cold weather to hear about my book, Edward Durrell Stone, Modernism's Populist Architect. Um, in preparing for tonight's talk, um, I thought about the two, I thought I'd, I'd begin by say, telling you the two questions that people most ask me about the book. The first one is, um, why did you write about Edward Durrell Stone? What's so interesting about this mid-20th century architect no one seems to care much about or remember? My answer comes from my book. I'm going to quote it. Colossus, visionary, giant. These are just some of the superlatives used to describe Stone in his prime in the late 1950s when he emerged as one of the first celebrity architects. The diversity and scope of his architecture knew no bounds, and at his peak, Stone was acknowledged as one of the most distinguished and progressive American architects with a huge and prestigious workload that brought him exceptional prosperity. I also explained that during Stone's 40-year career, spanning from the Great Depression to the oil embargo of 19, early 1970s, Stone erected buildings on four continents, in 13 foreign countries, and in 32 states. And yet, back in 2001, when the magazine, asked me, magazine Antiques asked me to write an article about one of Stone's international-style buildings, I could find not much on the internet few scattered articles with recent research, and little commentary in any of the surveys and reference books. So I had to ask, how could an architect whose name was once a household word fail to, su to sustain widespread appeal? I wanted to know why there was deficient commentary and more, an absence of scholarly examination. Unlike Stone's peers, Saarinen, Rudolph, and Johnson, and so I embarked on, well, about 15 years of research. The second question I'm most often asked is, but do you really like his architecture? My answer is emphatically yes but probably not for the reasons, uh, the obvious reasons. And so to explain what I consider Stone's contributions to modernism and why I think he deserves a prominent place in the history of modernism, I've developed five um, key talking points. Okay, let's get, oh. <laughs> okay, good. The first is that Stone was a prompt, was was a pioneer for daring to experiment with modernism's new ideas and also f for being able adept at anticipating and articulating evolving trends and values. This is the Richard Mandel House in Bedford Hills, New York, 1933 to 1935, and it represents Stone's first foray into modernism. He was brought to the job by Donald Desky, with whom he'd just finished working at Radio City Music Hall. And similar to that spectacular project at the Mandel how Stone and Dusky created a total work of art, both inside and out, a concept still rare in modern architecture. Now, the Mandela House demonstrates a number of aesthetic cliches from the European modern masters, including Le Corbusier's thin rally columns and horizontal strip windows inserted into non-supporting white walls of the Villa Savoie in Poissy, France. Oh, let's see. The model of, of the, Le Corbusier's house was prominently displayed at the Museum of Modern Art's International Style Exhibition in 1932, shown here. Now, even though Stone had been aware of such contemporary works during his two-year tour of Europe as a roach-traveling scholar, he believed that this exhibition was the single event to profoundly influence 20th century architecture. In the exhibition, the, prin the principles of the international style were established by the curators and presented almost as a pre-packaged formula. Using the Beaux-Arts methodology that Stone had learned at Harvard and then MIT, neither of which he graduated from, Stone was especially proficient at extracting, modifying, and dispersing details from the works of the European masters. 
Stone gave the Mandel House dining room here on the right a prominent curved wall, which indeed shows the influence of Le Corbusier, uh, Mies van der Rohe, and especially Mendelssohn. While its glass block, already established in Europe, is not the first application in the United States as Stone claimed, um, he certainly anticipated the upco its upcoming popularity that was spurred by new production um, by Owens, Illinois, and Corning Glass, respectively, in 1933 and 1935. Stone's awareness of multiple sources and his exceptional ability to articulate them was serving him well already at this early date. The dining room um, certainly rivals up there at the left Dusky's dining room in Roxy's apartment at the Music Hall. Um, Stone may also have been aware of the curved living spaces in the Huntington, New York House of Wallace Harrison, the architect under whom Stone worked at Rockefeller Center. But it's also interesting to note that Stone had previously experimented with the curved dining room, as well as other significant details that show up in his future work, in one of his student competition um, drawings submitted to the Beaux-Arts Institute of Design in 1927. While the furnishings by Desky in the Mandel House were somewhat austere in the modern manner, uh, the interior does have a subtle quality of glamour, a theme increasingly pronounced in Stone's later work. He, here, the elegant second floor staircase of crisp angles is accentuated by streamlined railing, recalling uh, the music hall's Art Deco aesthetic. Now, this photograph was taken by Edward Steichen for Vogue, whom Stone may have met, or he did meet for sure, while both were working at the Center Theater at Rockefeller Center. Stone obviously been impressed by the artistic collaboration at Rockefeller Center as another artist who worked um, for the Mandel House, uh, Whithold Gordon, designed the mural in, um, in the ballroom, which is just under the dining room. And she had worked, done some of the um, a mural in the bathroom at Radio City Music Hall. Because the Mandel House is a remarkable early example of the international style, not surprisingly, the more than 15 contemporary reviews document the divergent responses ranging from intrigue and optimism to apprehension and understand and misunderstanding. So in 1936, when Stone produced for Collier's magazine plans, specifications, and a model for a house of moderate means, his design, clearly a simplified Mandel house, was merely promoted as a house for modern living. Presented in a series of six articles, the response was tremendous with 1,200 plans ordered within three months. Since I started my research, eight houses designed according to the stone plan have come to light. The one here in Louisville, Kentucky, um, meticulously taken care of by an architect who lives there, um, attests to Stone's ability to successfully transform the high-end Mandel house design into a popular commodity for the geographically, economically, and culturally diverse. The best known commission Stone worked on in the international style is the Museum of Modern Art. Philip Goodwin, a museum trustee and benefactor, had been named architect but admittedly had no experience in modern design and needed stone. While the building committee members desired a cutting edge design, no one could say what that was and many heated debates ensued. Stone's gracious, accommodating, and diplomatic manner along with his good ideas and clear talent easily earned their trust. Consequently, his design for the front facade was chosen, which consists of ground floor glass, a glass wall above which are milky white Thermalex glass panels derived from a new technology, and then two rows of strip windows, all framed with marble. Though somewhat altered, the facade still exists today, as shown on the left, as part of a large cohesive group of volumes that taken together, however, I think diminish the signature of stone. As the ground floor plan shows, the deep recess of the entrance at the street level intended to attract passers-by passers and symbolize 
the museum's openness to new clientele. Um, this was accentuated by a curved marquee that was echoed inside by the reception desk, pictured here in a photograph from the opening of 1939. While the hopeful expectation that the building would establish firm criteria for modern architecture in the United States, um, it, it was not fulfilled and in fact fueled the greater debate about modernism. But for a time it did earn stone the reputation of pioneer modernists. But the public was still uneasy, and Stone needed work. And so in the 1940s, he um, studied his residential designs with using emerging American trends for vernacular architecture with indigenous materials and traditions. He was inspired by the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, never a mentor, but a very dear friend, and the Bay Area style architects. Though Stone later said he did not find much satisfaction with what he called his hair shirt period of work, it was in these small projects that his mature aesthetic developed. The William Turner House is Stone's, and it was um, completed in 1951, is Stone's most memorable building of the period for a number of reasons. First, it's an early demonstration of his interest in eliminating the hallway by utilizing the central atrium for circulation, a concept, he said, that evolved from the ancient Roman houses of Pompeii. Even though the atrium space received little fanfare outside of Teaneck, New Jersey, where the house still exists, um, Going forward, it would govern his planning principles. As the atrium here demonstrates, the house also exudes a naturalistic theme in the gabled skylights, blinds of bamboo, redwood panel soffit with greenery, flagstone floors, red brick walls, and even a narrow pool with stepping stones suggestive of an outdoor stream leading to the master bedroom. It is, as one critic noted, outdoor living inside. Also of note is the direct influence of Wright on the exterior in the seven foot sheltering overhang, low rectangular redwood framed windows, and especially the horizontal paneling, which recalls Wright's George Sturgis house, um, for example, up there at the top, for, um, the, for, uh, which is uh, 1939. The son of the original owner of the Turner house wrote, I was probably in college when I saw a picture of one of Wright's houses for the first time. I can remember the shock that I felt. What had seemed so original at our house was not so original after all. Another important change for Stone came with the rehabilitation of the Victoria Theater on West 46th Street in New York City in 1949. To hide the remains of the shoddy old theater walls, Stone created one of his most distinguished, though economic, decorative features, metal meshwork, here composed of stampings punched from the sides of motion picture reels and strung together. The boldly sculpted figures of Day and Night by Gwen Lux, another collaborator, collaborator at the Music Hall, accentuated the two-dimensional pattern. Stone would use this flexible fabric, as identified in his 1960 patent, in various iterations from a utilitarian um, uh, dining room at an upstate college in New York to the Beckman Auditorium at Caltech up on the left in Pasadena. The Remy Virginia Morrisani House um, of 1954 continues to demonstrate Stone's predilection for decorative patterning, often of natural materials. In the atrium, here called the patio to suggest once again outdoor living inside, cypress grill work and bricks with alternating stretchers and headers are enhanced by the striated shadows through the gabled skylights and pool reflections. In the master bedroom, the only picture ever published of the house. Um, the flickering flames from the fireplace heighten the luminescence of the kappa shells covering the doors and in turn the pinkish white marble. Though unfortunately the plaster dome with zodiac signs was never realized, it is clear that Stone was now going for drama. 
My second point I want to make about Stone is that in the 1950s, he set out to revitalize modernism by innovating an aesthetic that has been called New Romanticism, which exhibits characteristics that had been censured by modernists. His new aesthetic was specifically developed in two international government commissions built concurrently, the first being the American Embassy Chancery in New Delhi, India, which is still considered his masterpiece. Evolving from the simple concept of a classic temple, the chancery is a mass, majestic rectangular volume that hovers between a podium raised seven feet and a pronounced roof extending 20 feet beyond the wall plane. At the foot of the grand staircase is a large circular pool of fountains to induce serenity and to reflect the building, just as at the Taj Mahal, a clear inspiration for stone. At the time, it must be remembered, modernism had been associated in the United States with political radicalism. And so in response, the building committee required Stone to de-emphasize modernism and focus more on regional inspirations. His answer is the flat, abstractly patterned, perforated grill made on site out of concrete and marble aggregate that wraps around the building. Its application, however, is patently novel in that the grill is positioned directly in front of a modern glass curtain wall. Thus, the traditional function of the wall split between the grill to reduce the heat and glare and enhance visual privacy and avoid monotony, and the curtain wall for light and insulation. Inside, Stone aggrandized his outdoor living inside theme in the grand two-story atrium covered with suspended mesh shade and predominated by a large water garden which accommodated a fantastic display of jets, stepping stones, and lushly planted islands of various shapes. The building, it was said by critics, provided a new prototype for government architecture by showing that monumentality which is abhorred by modernists, no longer had to be articulated in a specific format. And yet the classicism Stone inserted in his modernism was not the highly praised skin and bones of Mies van der Rohe, but rather it incorporated more traditional details such as grand scale, strict symmetry, axial definition, centralized space, and hierarchy, all of which he experimented as, with as a Beaux-Arts student. The grill work is another aspect of the building that opposed modern principles, not only because of its decoration, um, but because it is deliberately feminine. The critics' readings of it as delicate, lacy, saccharine, dainty, and prissy confront the emphatically masculine bias of modernism. Pickley articulated in 1918 by Le Corbusier and Osenfant, who wrote, there's a hierarchy in the arts, decorative art at the bottom and the human form on top, because we are men. <laughs> Thanks, Christian. Even though Stone knew that his foreign commissions had to epitomize the democratic spirit, for the United States Pavilion at the Universal and International Exposition in Brussels in 1958, Stone recognized he must elicit an emotional response, not only from the 30 million who would visit, but from people across the globe who would only know it through the media. The pavilion then was even more imaginative and adventuresome than the embassy chancery. Half of the site, as you can see from the plan on the top, was devoted to a plaza, the only outdoor oasis um, at the fair, embellished with an elliptical reflecting pool containing about 50 fountains and a rotating sculpture by Alexander Calder. The rest went to the 340-foot, two-story, three-span circular structure, complemented by two smaller circular buildings with theaters and offices. As a symbol of democratic ideas, Stone astutely made transparency a key feature by creating simple exterior walls of plastic laminated sheets held in tension with a light steel lattice system. Inside, and I'm sorry this slide's a little dark, the ceiling is swagged with glittering mesh cat canopy in the most delightful stone manner, with the, while the ceiling was pierced with a central opening for daylight and to collect rainwater in a central outdoor pool. The 
pavilion as fantasy played into the contemporary enthusiasm for contrived display. If Disneyland, for example, and in the extravagant Miami Baroque hotels of Morris Lapidus. Not surprisingly then, Stone's pavilion was recognized by the trade for his reproachment between modern architecture and popular taste. And okay, my third point is, in the wake of the tremendous response to these international commissions, Stone shifted his attention to refashioning his aesthetic for the American audience, reared on Hollywood cinema and Madison Ave Avenue advertising. He was convinced his aesthetic was so versatile it could be applied to projects with varying functions, and at least in 1958, he was right. The Stewart Company in Pasadena which made pharmaceutical product, products, was such a joy to work in that production increased by more than 107% in the first seven months of operation with almost no employee turnover. Considered an architectural marvel for offering a new type of factory architecture, the building received the highest award from the American Institute of Architects. This nearly 400 foot long facade is clad in a New Delhi patterned grill, half running along the sheltered carport on the left of the plan there, and in the other half shielding terraces off the private offices. The grill work, brilliantly illuminated from behind at night, was surrounded by a black bottom pool dotted with planted islands and fountains. The bridge, leading to the to inside the entry, gave the illusion the building was floating. The two-story atrium inside was sumptuously embellished with gold-colored hanging planters and mother-of-pearl bubble lights suspended at varying heights from a coppered ceiling pierced by some 80 plastic skylights. Okay, I'm going to jump here, guys, because this... Okay. Um, the out of this world house, as Stone referred to the home he built at the same time for Josephine and Bruno Graf in Dallas, introduced luxury and gracious formality into his early residential concepts of atriums, grills, cloistered gardens, watered, and patterned decoration. The atrium plan is defined by a number of freestanding screens, the first separating the foyer from the most tantalite tantalizing space behind the dining area where the table and chairs sat on a round island surrounded by, by an illuminated pool. Upstairs, a large master bedroom looks out onto two covered terraces. The larger one shown in these pictures, one with Mrs. Graff, um, captures how the eye-catching overhead aluminum trellis plays off the New Delhi pattern exterior grill work on the upper portion of the house. Though the exterior exploits conspicuous display, the exterior recalls Stone's earlier international star work, especially in the lower half's plain white stucco surface pierced only with a glazed entrance, suggesting that Stone never totally abandoned modernism he just adapted it to his needs. Stone obviously believed that, similar to the Graff House, an ornamental house was fitting for the U.S. government, and so expanded on it for the ambassador's residence called Roosevelt House in, in the New Delhi Embassy, which was completed in 1963. Rather than considering the practical day-to-day -day needs of the family, however, he anticipated formal diplomatic gatherings supported by servants, which led one ambassador to refuse to even live in the house. Centered by a lavish two-story atrium, here called the Salon, the plan is divided into three sections connected by a grand balcony, reminding Ambassador Galbraith of the concourse of Grand Central Station. Stones Imaginative artistry shows in the wonderful open sculpted, sculpted spiral stair just underneath the balcony, which ceremoniously, which ceremoniously winds around a small cir circular pool with a fountain. To harmonize visually with the chancery next door, 
starting to define much of the ground floor space as well as the family and guest sitting rooms upstairs with open grill work. So in addition to the absence of warmth and coziness was a lack of acoustical privacy causing critics to call it nothing less than a white elephant. And the, it's since all been um, filled in. Stone's reworked townhouse on East 64th Street in New York City, which still stands in startling contrast to, his brown, to its brownstone neighbors, is one of its most pronounced statements of self-assertion. By removing the characteristic late 19th century bay when widening the windows, he was able to prodigiously cover the upper three floors with his new deli pattern grill. When completed, the critics said it was nothing more than a pocket edition of the collection of stone. With the mannered grill, here presented as a billboard or sign representing the architect's highly personal style more than anything else. And yet, and this is important. According to several media sources, the Stone House was the most talked about in the city, even by Wright, who reputedly raved about it. In fact, it received a tremendous amount of publicity, especially in the popular press, the standout feature being in Vogue magazine. Even though Stone later admitted he may have overused the grill, he recycled, or, he recycled or refigured it until about 1967 into countless formations of circles, stars, hexagons, octagons, quadrilaterals. In fact, the grill look became so fashionable it was applied to fabric, paper, and appliances. It became ubiquitous. My fourth point I want to make about Stone is that he was quick to recognize that a new generation of mass consumers was being organized as never before around the unparalleled influence of the mass media, particularly television and print. To claim the larger, more diverse audience, Stone relied on Maria, the second of his three wives, shown on the left in her own version of an Indian sari, which was sold by Vogue Patterns and featured in Ladies Home Journal. And that actually is a picture of her in their house. It's the screen to their kitchen. With Maria at his side, after they married in 1954, Stone said he was disgustingly content and that their marriage was responsible for his most significant architecture, implying that the palpable romanticism in his work emulated from her. Marie's responsibilities to her husband, ranging from hostess and sage to seductress and inspire, also included publicists between 1957 and 1964. She transformed his public in image, popularized his name, and navigated the emerging mass media attuned to the new popular culture. She learned her lessons well from Wright's wife, Olga Vanna, who observed, observed in one of her books that the gorgeous Marie is outspoken, frank, quick-minded. Quick Fiercely protective and loyal, Maria, for example, once informed an editor, it has often been said that Mr. Stone is the only American architect of any great standing who has left, and he is truly as indigenous and as rare as the American buffalo itself. <laughs> While her much acclaimed amorous marriage to Stone dissolved very openly and very antagonistically after 13 years, critics agree that Maria is still front and center in the Stone legacy. Her influence cannot be underestimated. A close examination of Stone's spiraling publicity in 1958 when the Brussels Pavilion was unveiled to the American audience demonstrates how it helped to establish Stone's new brand of modernism and utterly exalt the architect himself. When Ed Sullivan introduced Stone in the audience on his Sunday night variety show, he proclaimed with great pride that the United States Pavilion was the most magnificent at the exposition. Sullivan also put a plug in for the New Delhi Embassy, still under construction, noting that Wright had lavishly praised the plans. Similarly, when a guest on the game show, What's My Line, or when he was a guest on What's My Line, the host John Daly pronounced Stone's Pavilion the most beautiful building he'd ever laid his eyes on. 
The Stones also enthusiastically offered a tour of the recently completed townhouse to the millions of viewers of Ed Morrow's Person to Person show. In a world of celebrity, it was Maria who intu intuitively understood their private life was consumable merchandise. In addition to television, the ever-increasing selection of print was having similar effect, not just the trade journals, but the, but the the publications devoted to business, entertainment, fashion, literature, society, and popular culture. After Time Magazine produced a cover story on Stone in March 1958, he was named as one of the 13 foreign givers who work, whose work was to be presented in a two-year traveling exhibition, the venue pictured here at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art in Richmond in early 1960. The most ambitious promotional tool that Stone ever produced himself, at the insistence of Maria, I might add, is his own book, published in 1962, titled The Evolution of an Architect. As a biographical narrative, rather than, the the than a theoretical work, the mass market book was devised with an eye towards making the stone aesthetic familiar even to the ingenuous, with the hope that it would be viewed, like White's Prairie style, as a formal, long-lasting school of architecture. My fifth point is that Stone was intent on making potent statements with his architecture, even at the price of untold criticism, which still impacts not only our own perceptions, but the preservation of his buildings. With, the high, with his high-rise architecture, Stone was determined to deliver his message against the glass and metal commercial buildings, he had come to loathe on Park Avenue for their austere and temporal and temporary looking characteristics. As he explained on the Merv Griffin show, my name is Stone and I like to build in stone. You know, things that look like they're going to last. And so, for the perpetual savings and loan building in Beverly Hills of 1962, Stone merged his enthusiasm for nature, decoration, and historicism by uniquely wrapping the fanciful building with a shallow concrete tiered arcade. Boxes of ivy and bougainvillea draped over the concave parabolic arches made it seem as if it were a gigantic hanging garden. Correspondingly, the plaza demonstrates the light, his lifelong interest in creating complete environments, centered by a pool with fountains and a sculpture by Harry Bertrea, the prominent geometric pattern of the pavement and symmetrically placed flowering trees define it as an outdoor room. Stone's most significant effort at countering the gla glass box, as he liked to call these glass and metal skyscrapers, is the General Motors building in New York City. Completed in 1968, the 50-story skyscraper, his very first, is distinguished by marble-covered concrete piers that alternate between vertical rows of bronze-tinted glass bay windows, a feature derivative of neighborhood brownstones. In order to take in order to take advantage of the revised building code, allowing for increased height without setbacks, Stone provided for a large front plaza into which he inserted a large sunken forecourt, just like Rockefeller Center. The composition was heavily criticized for ignoring the street line, as well as the Grand Army Plaza, just across Fifth Avenue. More so, it was said, the, the consumer-oriented showmanship the GM was after equally apparent, was equally apparent in the pretentiously glitzy marble lobby followed the neighborhood's stately gentility. And yet, it must be footnoted, when the building was sold in 2009, it brought $2.9 billion, then the most ever paid for an office building in the United States. Though the sunken forecourt has since been replaced by a popular Apple store, the GM building has remained intact, unlike its successor, the American Standard Oil 
Indiana building, now the Aon building in Chicago, which sadly is not here tonight, but I will tell you what I think about that building. <laughs> the 80-story skyscraper stood alone in Chicago for its vertical piers of Carrara marble veneer, all of which had to be replaced in 1932 with thicker granite because of cracks in Boeing. While never a favor of the critics, it appealed to a conservative business clientele who wanted not just proven economy and efficiency, but predictability and even more built-in prestige. Standard Oil management was none too pleased when it realized that Stone repeated the design concept in the Montgomery County Administration Building in Dayton, Ohio. But more than any of his other buildings, it's Gallery of Modern Art at Two Columbus Circle in New York City that has consistently attracted the most passionate responses. It was conceived by Huntington Hartford, the heir to the AMP supermarket chain, who believed that modern art, and especially abstract expressionism, was a form of revolutionary propaganda. While Stone undoubtedly grasped Hartford's agenda, it offered an exceptional opportunity to showcase his architecture to a larger cultured audience. He knew that though centrally located, the small, awkward property on Columbus Circle, shown here with its former building, would present a challenge. But he wanted and worked hard to obtain the commission. Following the format of the Museum of Modern Art, with a restaurant on top and an auditorium below ground, the 10-story concrete structure was veneered with square panels of white marble. Nearly 1,500 framed glass vision panels, four to a square, bordered the facade, which echoed the arch of Columbus Circle. The ground floor plate glass windows were discreetly set back behind an arcade that stone extended around the building to give a unifying quality to the otherwise inconsistent dimensions. He settled on pronounced Venetian Gothic columns after experimenting somewhat uneasily, I might add, with various forms from forked to round-headed ones. Both Hartford and Stone agreed the museum should imbue visitors with a desire to own their own artwork, and the interiors were presented more as an elegant, spacious home or a private club than as a public museum, with the furnishings playing to the contemporary narrative of American glamour that was now permeating Stone's work. Though it's not much remembered, such critics as Ada Louise Huxtable admired his expert manipulation of the tightly organized exhibition spaces. Visitors were to take the elevator to the fifth floor and then descend to the other three gallery floors by means of two double-height half landings. Each gallery floor had three small galleries near the center service core and, more prominently, a long main gallery with a converse wall along the front, which is here at the top. The auditorium was said to resemble a jewel box with fabric-covered walls, wood grills, royal red carpeting and curtains, gold upholstery, and a ceiling covered with stone's mess work. All of this became signature for stone. Both typical stone details also enliven the ninth floor Polynesian restaurant, the element of exoticism following the South Seas theme of Paul Gauguin after whom the room was named, encouraged visitors to shed established beliefs in exchange for their own paradise, where myths are perpetuated and hierarchies of history, class, and race can be ignored. It was fantasy. The opening in March 1964, here represented by a photograph of Maria with, I believe, Salvador Dali, who had a number of works in the exhibition, allegedly eclipsed the season's social events, after which more than 300,000 visited in the first year. The museum was said to be a tourist must, with ecstatic mobs packing the place like Macy's at Christmas. But after five years, it went the way of the eccentric owner's other ill-fated investments. Thereafter, with each new phase of occupancy and the growing uncertainty of its destiny, opinions about the beginning became ever more polarized, ranging from uncompromising bourgeois decadence to, as Tom Wolfe called it, one of the few candles lit in the dark ages of New York architecture. What's more, 
The building was increasingly being labeled as kitsch, a charge that generally implies an aesthetic inadequacy. Susan Sontag's influential, influential essay, Notes on Camp, also published in 1964, still provides the most useful working construction for thinking about this building as kitsch, because it really does perfectly balance, as she wrote, a proper mixture between the exaggerated, the fantastic, the passionate, and the naive. There is just no better description. Unlike the Gallery of Modern Art, which was largely redeveloped in 2008 in the face of fierce protests, the Kennedy Center has maintained its position as an icon of popular culture and I am confident will continue to do so um, even with the $100 million expansion project which was just recently announced. Initiated in the boom years of the late 1950s, when it was finished in 1971, the national situation had radically changed and people asked not only if this deliberate spectacle was appropriate, but if it could collapse the established boundaries to which there was a far greater sensitivity between high and low brow cultures. But Stone had understood from the get-go that a national cultural center must gratify great numbers of people from diverse backgrounds by responding to their tastes and interests. In the enormous grand foyer <coughs> into which the three primary performance halls open, Stone united high art with entertainment by combining democracy white, movie house red, and imperial gold luster to produce an American glamour of unmatched magnitude. In the best Beaux-Arts tradition, where the audience can both see and be seen as part of the drama, it stirs the aspirations of fame and fortune, the capitalistic mark of success, deepened by the poignant recollection of the slain president for whom the building was made a living memorial. And yet, I'm just gonna go back, and yet, as a work of kitsch, the building can also be viewed as a sensational artifice for the masses that fails to reach a condition of greatness because of its garish sentimentality to previous works, overwhelming presence, and excessive opulence. More so, the architect's incandescence shows in the building itself a sure sign of kitsch, leading one person to aptly comment at the Kennedy Center opening, it's just Edward Stone, that's all. The critics deplored it, the people loved it. After the opening, J. William Fulbright, the Democratic Senator who sponsored the bill and was from Stone's hometown in Fayetteville, Arkansas, rightfully hailed Stone as a populist architect. In its, ten, in its first 10 years, the Kennedy Center was the capital's second most popular tourist attraction after the Washington Monument. It was, and still is, a tribute to the popular culture Stone helped to create. I'm not an apologist for Stone, especially at the end of his career, when his buildings became repetitive, banal, and, and banal and uninspired. As I established in my PhD dissertation, which examines the perception and criticism of his architecture, there's been a deep-seated disconnect between Stone's popular appeal and critical dismissal. The late Ada Louise Huxtable, the pioneering modern architecture critic who was his greatest defector, was intent on demeaning his romantic brand of modernism because it so violated the great modernist taboos of decoration, fantasy, femininity, regionalism, monumentality, and historicism, the latter a forerunner of postmodernism. Huxtable's comment that Stone's Columbus Circle building, here at the left, looked like a die-cut Venetian plaza on lollipops, will forever be on people's lips when they hear her name, as David Dunlap recently demonstrated in his New York Times obituary. Arguably, an awareness of such criticisms, which continue to reverberate, influenced the redesign of the building shown here in which the lollipops are shrouded inside the building now, which is there. The 
critical opposition to Stone's work is very much a part of the history of modernism. And yet, it must not diminish our appreciation of a, of a compelling American story. Unlike likely country boy, catapults his way to star architect by intuiting unprecedented opportunities and by creating a wholly unique aesthetic that dared to express the pursuits and values of the mid-20th century popular culture. Um,